Brooks here to talk uh, to us today about the different hypersomnia diagnoses and how we, the patients, can work more closely with our doctors to achieve the best possible outcomes. You can find her on Twitter at Damn Good Sleep. Welcome, Dr. Morris. Thank you so much. Is my microphone on? Okay, there we go. All right. Thank you so much. Again, I'm Anne Marie Morse. Um, and just in case you're wondering, Damn Good Sleep is D A M M, Dr. Anne Marie Morse. So, not to be a, a lewd word, but uh, Damn Good Sleep. So, I'm really excited because today I get to talk about something that I'm incredibly passionate about, and that's education, empowerment, and activation for the patient. I want you to be the captain of your ship. All right, so today what we're gonna cover is a brief overview of central disorders of hypersomnolence basics. We're gonna talk about symptoms you may encounter in your journey, approach to making the diagnosis, and what matters to you in setting your goals to craft your best future you. So although you've already had multiple presentations discussing what the symptoms are and discussing treatment options and things like that, one of the things that I recognize as a provider is that we very frequently do a terrible job educating you, the patient, on what your disease looks like. We make the diagnosis based on the symptoms that you are experiencing or know to report to us, but very frequently we fail to describe to you what are all the symptoms that are possible in your disease state. And then we don't treat them because you don't know to even let us know that those are a part of your journey. So I really do want to kind of take this journey with you today and cover all of these basics so that you can walk away from this presentation and feel more engaged, more empowered, and more active in your patient journey. So when we're talking about hypersomnolence, there's hypersomnia or hypersomnolence. Hypersomnia means that you're sleeping excessive amounts. Hypersomnolence is excessive daytime sleepiness despite adequate sleep duration. When you're talking about the different central disorders of hypersomnolence, it includes narcolepsy type 1, narcolepsy type 2, idiopathic hypersomnia, Klein-Levine syndrome. Hypersomnia is either to, due to a medical condition, substance, um, or medication, or with a psychiatric condition, and then finally, insufficient sleep syndrome. Okay, so narcolepsy type 1, this is where you're having symptoms of excessive daytime sleepiness, and we typically are diagnosing this with an MSLT. So that's where your average sleep latency is less than 8 minutes, and you have two sleep onset run periods. What does that it means that you take the test, you have four to five opportunities to nap. We're seeing, do you fall asleep in those naps? How quickly do you fall asleep? And on average, is it less than eight minutes? And are there at least two periods where you go into REM sleep in less than 15 minutes? There typically will be episodes of cataplexy. And if there's not episodes of cataplexy, but we did a lumbar puncture on you, and we saw that your CSF was low, less than 110 picograms per ml, then you'd be diagnosed as narcolepsy type one. In narcolepsy type two, you're seeing that that's all of the same information except for two things. You're not gonna have cataplexy, and if we did a spinal tap on you, you'll have normal hypocretin levels. There's also the addition of looking at the fact that there's primary versus secondary narcolepsy. What does this mean? Primary narcolepsy means you have narcolepsy for the sake of having narcolepsy. There's not another reason that has brought you to developing no symptoms. In secondary narcolepsy, these are individuals who are having some other organic lesion or reason that is insulting their lateral hypothalamus, where our rex and hypocretin neurons live, and that is creating those symptoms. So people who have multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, stroke, neoplasm or, or cancer or tumor, these are all people who would be uh, potentially at risk. Why is that important to know? Because many of these patients will be told that they're fatigued or they're tired. Of course you're sleepy. You have cancer. Of course you're sleepy. You have multiple sclerosis. And so it is important to recognize that there's many faces of these conditions and that it's not one size fits all. When we're looking at the primary versus secondary narcolepsies, it also is an important thing to consider in regards to who do you need to act, who do you need to advocate for yourself to. Um, so this is, I think, a really important thing um, to understand. When we're talking about idiopathic hypersomnia, this is a diagnosis, again, where there's excessive daytime sleepiness. The multiple sleep latency test, you're going to have um, an average sleep latency of less than eight minutes, but you're not going to see that REM dissociative phenomena that we see in narcolepsy. So typically, these are individuals who will have less than two sleep onset REM periods. There's not gonna be a history of cataplexy. And when you're talking about cataplexy, it's the most specific symptom for narcolepsy. So if you're eliciting that history, you typically are thinking narcolepsy until proven otherwise. 
And if you were to, to do a spinal tap on these individuals, they would have normal CSF hypocretin. So what are the key features of narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia? This is where, as I had said to you earlier, we tend to do a really poor job in, in, in enabling our patients to understand what these disease processes may look like. So when you talk about narcolepsy, the clinical features are this classic pentad, excessive daytime sleepiness, the most sensitive symptom. What does that mean? 100% of patients with narcolepsy have excessive daytime sleepiness. However, what we know is excessive daytime sleepiness can be caused by a variety of things. And so when I get a history of excessive daytime sleepiness, hypersomnolence disorders need to be on my differential. Other features that are included in narcolepsy is disturbed nocturnal sleep. Also recognizing that Many times, patients who have narcolepsy get mischaracterized as insomnia. Why? Because there is this stigma surrounding narcolepsy that they just fall asleep all over the place. They're just go, they're people who are unable to hold a job, they're unable to eat food, they just fall asleep. They're, they're just, they, they must be able to fall asleep easily. So when a person who has narcolepsy describes that I have a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep, there's no way that you can possibly have narcolepsy. That's the reason that you're sleeping during the day. You're not sleeping well at night. As opposed to understanding that disturbed nocturnal sleep is a major component of the disability associated with narcolepsy. And so many times, the patients that I have seen feel like there's something wrong with them and are almost afraid to tell me that they're having disturbed nocturnal sleep. Many times it's because of the fact that they are worried that I'm going to think that they're making it up or that I'm going to take away the treatment that has been helping them not nap during the day because they're afraid it's the side effects, where it is actually a part of their disease state. Paralysis. These are episodes where as the person is falling asleep or waking up, that they're experiencing a transient episode of REM atonia, but their brain is awake. Again, narcolepsy is a REM dissociative disease that can be explained by all of these different symptoms. Sleep paralysis very commonly can be associated with sleep-related hallucinations. These may be visual, tactile, or auditory hallucinations. And so sometimes we limit this discussion. I don't know what just, okay. By purely asking about, do you see things as you fall asleep or wake up? And we'd fail to ask them about, do you feel, do you hear? Um, uh, but the, many times there are issues where they're hearing things. And that might be the, an opportunity to be able to understand what actually is being experienced. When you have these types of descriptions, it's important to know about them because of the fact that there's other symptoms that this may lead into that patients are maybe not recognizing to tell you. So other symptoms may be nightmare disorder. Because of the fact that patients with narcolepsy have very vivid dreaming, they may experience nightmare disorder. Because of the fact that they're having, might be seeing things or feeling like they're seeing things and having these nightmare disorders, they may also experience things like REM, be REM behavior disorder or dream enactment behavior. The final um, symptom is cataplexy. And cataplexy is an important one, and recognizing that every individual's journey in cataplexy can be very different. When you talk about the stigma and the way that narcolepsy is typically described, we generally have this movie set type of description of that they just fall to the ground. And even if you were to Google it and look at it online, many times you see the YouTube videos of someone depicting a cataplectic event and everyone else just laughing at it. And the reality is it's not funny. It's something that's scary to patients when they're experiencing it. And more often than not, generalized cataplexy is not the most common thing. It's typically partial cataplexies. And instead of being able to identify that or elicit that in the history, many patients just have already self-described as, I'm just a clumsy person. It's because I'm sleepy. That's why this is my 10th iPhone. All of those screens, they just keep breaking. Uh, and the reality is, is that this is even debated when you talk to key opinion leaders about how intensive do you do, you, uh, do a history to identify a history of cataplexy. If the patient's not complaining about it, then it's not a problem that needs to be treated. I argue staunchly against that. If the patient's not complaining about it, they may not know that they're experiencing it and how it's disabling them. They may have now just accustomed their lives to accommodate for these symptoms. I don't see, I don't go to comedy shows, I don't watch sad movies, and I don't like to listen to music that makes it, that is emotionally provoking. That is how many times patients will drive their journey in order to accommodate these symptoms.
It's important to recognize that when you're talking about this history of cataplexy, it is the most specific symptom in narcolepsy, meaning that those who do have a history of cataplexy, you should be thinking narcolepsy until proven otherwise because of the fact that it's a very rare entity to occur with, with other neurologic diseases. It also is important to recognize that as you look at the patient journey, cataplexy can look different in early childhood versus adult. So even today, when you talk about the definition of cataplexy, you generally will find a definition that says transient episodes of loss of tone. The reality is in 2011, Dr. Plotziad of Italy published a beautiful article in Brain that described all of the active motor phenomena that cataplexy can look like in pediatrics. And even in some adults who have a, a new abrupt onset can experience this. And these are that they can have tongue thrusting, eyebrow raising, even a persistent hypotonia with dyskinetic movements. And so it's important to recognize that because in the patient journey, they may have identified all of these symptoms and labeled them as something different. They get labeled as tick disorder, movement disorder. They get labeled as seizure disorder. And so the reality is there's a lot of unpacking that needs to go on there. When you're talking about idiopathic hypersomnia, again, you're generally talking about excessive daytime sleepiness, and they also are experiencing very significant sleep inertia, or this sleep drunkenness. This is where, when, you, when you're trying to wake them up, it feels like you're almost waking the dead. It's very hard for them to get up and go, and they really look like they're just in an automatic behavior, trying to get things done. They may or may not have long sleep times. I think Dr. Rai did a great job of describing that. We still have so much work to do to really fully define the differences and the similarities um, in these conditions. And they typically lack these REM dissociative features. So one of the things that I think is really important is when we're eliciting these histories, and as Dr. Rai had, um, had mentioned, we're relying and married to the multiple sleep latency test and SOREMs and all that, we really have to allow our patients to define the experiences that they're having. And when we're applying treatments, we need for the patient to fully understand all the symptoms that may be present and disabling to them, because if we purely just reflect on an upward sleepy scale or any of these validated scales, we may be missing the forest amongst the trees. This is, a, I think, a beautiful um, table that is available on the Hypersomnia Foundation's website that really does cover all of these different symptoms and which conditions um, uh, may or may not have them. What are the other things that I think are important? So I talked a lot about these sleep issues that patients may experience. But all of these other symptoms that I'm listing here are also extraordinarily impactful on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the things that I have been humbled by most recently is the prevalence of autonomic changes that can occur in individuals with central disorders of hypersomnolence. Many times they can have what we call dysautonomia, meaning that your autonomic nervous system, the thing that controls your heart rate, your blood pressure, how you sweat, how your body temperature is, becomes dysregulated. And so we see that these patients may get diagnosed with things like POTS. Um, they can have heart rate changes, blood pressure changes, skin, skin color, or temperature changes. This can be very disabling, and many times the medications that we're utilizing can either enhance these symptoms, or sometimes they can benefit these symptoms. Brain fog and cognitive challenges. This sometimes is something that many patients will underestimate because they just are presuming that this is a part of their sleepiness and that their sleepiness just hasn't been adequately treated. But the reality is, is that very frequently there is cognitive dysfunction that develops in conjunction with this. And so that does mean that we need to be thinking beyond drugs, but also partnering with neuropsychology to get testing, to understand what accommodations and what type of therapies can actually help in rehabbing those difficulties. Automatic behaviors. This is one that the more I start to meet with patients and ask them specifically about automatic behaviors, the more horrified I become about automatic behaviors. So automatic behaviors, when individuals are looking like I am right now, talking, walking, doing things, and then they're, and they're completely asleep and unaware. It's basically almost like sleepwalking. And so I've had patients give me stories of being out with friends before they were diagnosed, and one that I, I think of all the time was a young woman who told me, I woke, I realized where I was, and thank God my friend was with me, and I was at a man's house who I just met. 
and she woke up and just started crying because she didn't know where she was or anything like that. And so we think about automatic behavior, typically the one that everyone kind of thinks of is, is I'm driving my car and I go, oh my god, how did I get here? Um, or in the students who they write, they're taking notes, the next thing they look down and they wrote all the names of their favorite football team. Um, and so those seem, those seem like, okay, yeah, a lot of people have that. But the reality is that these are things that can be injurious. It can be the mom who's trying to bake cookies with her kiddo and goes in the oven without the oven mitts on and wakes up when she's burning her hands. So it is important to ask these questions in order for us to know what is a disability that's being experienced. Mood changes are extraordinarily common. So one of the things that um, uh, you hear time and again is that there's an increased likelihood for psychiatric comorbidity, the depression, anxiety, bipolar. And so one of the challenges that we fully don't understand is, is it, is it comorbidity or is it part and parcel of the disease, right? We know that both of them are, are brain-based disorders. And so is it part and parcel of that that some may just be more susceptible to it? Or is it because of the fact that you have been diagnosed with a chronic condition and that chronic condition makes the life more of a struggle. So it is important to be able to engage and discuss this. We recognize weight gain is a major challenge. Some of that may be related to, again, the changes in the neurotransmitters um, that may make it more likely for you to have food-seeking behaviors and have less satiety or sense of fullness. Um, but it also may be related to the excessive daytime sleepiness and sedentary lifestyle. And as mentioned earlier, recognizing that other sleep disorders can also co-occur. Individuals who have narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia are much higher risk for obstructive sleep apnea. The number of times I hear sleep providers say you have sleep apnea and that's why you're sleepy and there's no further evaluation done drives me crazy. Um, but there's um, these, other tr these other disorders that can potentially also contribute. So the testing, I'm not going to go over in much detail just because of the fact that it's already been covered several times, but we typically do sleep diary actigraphy, polysomnography, multiple sleep latency. Sometimes there'll be genetics or HLA testing that may help us to kind of determine things. And then also CSF hypocretin levels. So this is just an illustration. You'd be able to get um, a sleep diary like this at the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's um, website. And so sleep diaries, I think, are very helpful. Why? Because Having information that you can track and be able to measure and see, am I making any improvements, getting better, getting worse, is very powerful. It's powerful for you, but it also is an illustration that you can utilize over time for you and your provider to guide your outcomes. In addition to keeping track of your actual schedules, you can use this as an opportunity to be able to determine whether or not any of those other sleep-related phenomena are occurring for you, and are they getting better or getting worse. In terms of the polysomnography, this typically is done to rule out other um, sleep pathology, but we also are using it to be able to ensure that there's at least six hours of sleep before going on to um, the MSLT. There have been other versions of polysomnography that have been tested specifically for conditions like idiopathic hypersomnia, recognizing what a limitation the MSLT is specifically in those conditions. Um, so 24-hour and 32-hour polysomnographies that are, have been performed to be able to try and get at capturing more patients and being able to um, adequately diagnose them. So when you're talking about the MSLT, um, this is four to five opportunities to nap. They're separated by two hours. Um, uh, the challenge is, is that even though in a lot of literature there's these very high sensitivities and specificities, that's in your ideal population. The reality is for narcolepsy type 2 and idiopathic hypersomnia, those sensitivities are nowhere near that. Um, and really in and IH, we see that approximately 40% or more patients are not meeting that eight-minute criteria, less than eight-minute criteria. And so this is the struggle of the field, is that there are many sleep providers where you have an average sleep, you fell asleep on all four or five naps, your average sleep latency is nine minutes, and you get told, the number of sleep reports I've said that this patient doesn't have a central disorder of hypersomnolence. That's horrifying. It's horrifying to know that after the age of five, you shouldn't nap. As a grown adult, if you're able to fall asleep on four to five naps, you are pathologically sleepy. And so the question that as a field that we have to determine is, when do you treat pathologic sleepiness? And as Dr. Rye had um, presented about lumpers or splitters, I think as a field, we have to determine, do we lump excessive daytime sleepiness together and try to optimize the symptoms while working through how we split you apart?
And the reality is, is that we have to put the patient at the center of these conversations and we need to engage the patient to understand how we can make their lives better. Because sleepiness is not optional um, to, to treat or to live with. It's a very disabling symptom. All right. In terms of the genetics um, and CSF, um, uh, the genetics many times, um, we're talking about the HLA type testing. There is increasing research that's really trying to look further into the genetics to understand whether or not there's genetic susceptibilities to any of these disorders. Um, but the HLA testing really is a risk stratifier. It helps us to understand um, if a person is HLA DQB10602 positive, it may allow us to have more of a risk stratifier for narcolepsy type 1, potentially narcolepsy type 2 as well. About 95 to 99% of people with narcolepsy type 1 will be this HLA positivity. Those with narcolepsy type 2, that's more around 40 to 50%. And then um, an idiopathic hypersomnia wouldn't really have a um, association. In um, CSF hypocretin, it's considered the gold standard for diagnosis. Why? Because of the fact that I can do an LP, and if it's positive, I can be 100% certain, right? So that's why it's considered a gold standard. However, you will find that clinically, it is not routinely done. And the reason why clinically it's not routinely done is because if you're narcolepsy type 2 or idiopathic hypersomnia, you're not going to have value in the negative test. Um, but also because many times when you're looking at sleep providers, they, they typically aren't doing lumbar punctures. So it tends to be a logistics thing. Um, however, I do find that in challenging cases, especially ones where maybe there's medications that I can't um, wash out for the patient because it might be unsafe to take them off their antidepressants and their tests are borderline and her symptoms are unclear, it sometimes can be helpful um, as an additional factor to look at. So one of the things that I think is the most important question that I ask every patient that I see is what can't you do because of your central disorder of hypersomnolence? And so I most recently um, uh, did this on TikTok, and I asked patients who have narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia to stitch this. So if you're not familiar with TikTok, stitch means you take the beginning of a video and you stitch together your own video. Um, and so these were some of the real world responses that I got. I can't have emotional bandwidth, so I can't show up for the people I love. That to me, this, oh, sorry, that took me at the heart because they really became emotional. I can't drive. I'm a burden to my family. I can't stay awake. Excessive days time sleepiness wins every round. I can't do boring movies. I can't do skydiving. I couldn't do snakes and spiders before, but now I really can't do snakes and spiders. Hiking alone. And unfortunately, he couldn't be a famous actor. So I thought it was great. I, I, loved, I love engaging with um, the community. And th these responses were, were so emotion-filled and um, just really honest. So I thought that that's something that's helpful. The reason I asked that question to all of my patients is because as a field, we get trained to use validated scales to say what, whether or not someone's a responder. And I, I admire Dr. Rye's vision of saying how can we have biomarkers for response and, and maybe that will be a, a thing one day. Um, but the thing that I think is most important is for patients to be their own biomarker to tell me how I can help their lives get better. And so when I ask people, what can't you do because of your narcolepsy, the responses I hear, or idiopathic hypersomnia, the responses I hear are, I can't do my work make dinner, and help my kids with homework. I can't do my baseball practice anymore and maintain my grades. I used to be a straight-A student, and now I'm at risk of being left back. I can't be with my husband romantically because I'm too tired, and I just tell him no. And so those are all the responses that I need to understand, because when they come back to me, and their epirth went from a 17, to a seven, I do this, right? I go, I did a great job. Good job, Dr. Morris. No, I ask them, how are you doing with work, feeding your child, and then doing homework with them? When's the last time you were romantic with your husband? How are you doing in that baseball game? The answers I need to hear is, I'm the MVP. I just got promoted and my kid is getting straight A's because I'm able to help them every night. You know what I did last night? My husband. <laughs> so these are the things 
that are meaningful, right? These are the things that make a difference. I have yet to have a patient walk in to see me and say, doctor, I'm referred because I'm a 17. I'm better because I'm a five. They come in because they said, I got into a motor vehicle accident and that was my wake up call. I didn't know how I got to work. I realized there's something wrong here. These are the things that matter. And so it is important for patients to hear this because many times they feel guilty to tell their doctor, you're not doing enough for me. <laughs> I'm not well enough. I know my scale says this, but let me tell you how I still can't do one, two, or three. And so it is important, it is important for you to hear that. Engage your provider. What symptoms does, my, does the medication treat? What are the side effects? How long until I see benefit? How will this um, impact my other medical or psychiatric diagnoses? Will this impact any of my other medications? How will we determine progress? How will you know that I'm doing better? And what can I do to help track my symptoms? Because you want to be able to track those symptoms together. You want to be able to have something that you can look at for progress over time. And you need to go beyond medications. So many times your doctors are going to say to you, well, here's, here's your drug, Let's get, we're gonna get you better. The reality is, is that no disease just gets better with just a medication. You need ongoing education, right? You need to be able to revisit, these are different, these are different modalities we've identified to be able to track symptoms. These are different things that your disease may look like. We are now in this, this amazing period where there is a lot of attention on central disorders of hypersomnolence. And we're having more and more awareness of the medical comorbidities that can occur with that. And so that requires ongoing education to em empower you in knowing these are the other things that we need to look at beyond sleepiness and the other um, sleep-related symptoms. Social support and coping strategies are key. Julie Flygar from Project Sleep, she's a very close friend of me, um, and she probably is the very first person who I encountered in my journey as a sleep provider. Um, and she has drilled this into my head so, so strongly that social support is such an incredibly important factor. And so when you look at social support, it's not just looking at your family or looking at your friends. It's also looking at your peers who may also struggle with the same condition that you have because of the fact that peer mentorship has been proven to be one of the most effective strategies in helping and controlling a variety of different illnesses. Lifestyle optimization, behavioral strategies, and school and workplace accommodations. The combination of these things are critical to a much more productive lifestyle. There's also a variety of sleep resources that are available, and so it's important to take a look at all of these and be able to utilize the resources in a way that are going to help you be the most productive you. And that is all of the questions and comments that I was gonna make. What can I answer for you guys? Dr. Morse, uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, could you elaborate on when you think a CSF hypocretin me measurement is, a pro is necessary, sure. uh, given that most of the case, a lot of cases it's not, yes. but when does it help you make a decision? Sure, so many times um, it might be in a patient where there is significant symptoms that are concerning for narcolepsy, most typically narcolepsy type one. Um, if there's a history of cataplexy, then I, I will take the limitations of the MSLT and say, it's a limited study, but there's clearly, this is clearly narcolepsy type one. Um, if it's questionable as whether or not there's cataplexy present, and it's a patient who we have attempted to do a polysomnography and MSLT, um, and the REM, like the REM suppressing medications, like many times psychiatric medications, I can't get off, and the testing really is not as robust as I would like it to be. Um, so maybe average sleep latency is like 10 minutes or 12 minutes. Um, and there's not those SOREMs, then that will be a time where I'll offer that to a patient. The other times there are, are some of my extreme ages, so like the three, four, or five-year-olds, where it's just a struggle for the family to do it because maybe the child doesn't want all the wires on, and uh, exactly. So, so those are other times that I'll use it. And if I am going to um, consider an LP, I always get the HLA testing first. Why? Because if it's HLA negative, then I feel that it's gonna be a lower yield test. 
um, just because the fact that it's going to be unlikely that they're going to end up being an NT1. I also, one other time that I use it is in um, other neurologic conditions, um, so like in autoimmune encephalitis, um, uh, when I'm doing the LP anyway, I many times will send off the orexin um, uh, just to see whether or not there's anything there, because sometimes in those patients there can either be insomnia or hypersomnia at the onset, and so just to kind of characterize whether or not that in addition may be contributing to the symptoms. Okay, so we're going back and forth between uh, in-person questions and online, so sure. next question is online. So, again, these guys have keyboards, so they ask really long questions. <laughs> um, how, do, how do you partner with your doctor uh, to discuss changes in current research and understanding? Um, obviously, both sides are researching and trying to understand something new, um, and they want to make sure it's not a one-sided relationship. That's a, that's a really great question, and um, I think that part of that response is dependent on how willing your, your care provider may be to um, partner in this way. I think that there's always the opportunity, and as a patient, if you don't identify that you have a care provider who's willing to partner, um, then that sometimes is the call to action to find someone who's a better fit. Um, and so I generally will ask, I guess my response would be, depending on what it is that you're looking at trying to understand. So this is not about research itself. It's about them educating and researching like specific content, correct? I just want to make sure I'm understanding that correctly. Yeah, the, their concern seems uh, centered around, uh, you know, as they do their own research, they feel like the other doctor or their doctor may not be on the same page and they're, they're one hundred percent, one hundred percent. And I think what they may be experiencing is the cynicism that has developed in medicine um, of a lot of people saying, um, oh, I'm sorry, you, you've mistaken your Google uh, search with my doctorate degree. Right. And the reality is, is that that is an insulting way to approach patients. Um, uh, Google, in all honesty, you can, you can put in symptoms in Google and 70% of the time you get the right diagnosis. Um, that is better than many of the doctors I work with. Um, and so the reality is that you, um, uh, I think that it's important for you to bring the information. I think it's important for you to be aware of what is the quality of the information that you're utilizing, right? Um, and then if your doctor is dismissing it, asking them to then give you directions as to where you should find this information. So those resources that I listed in the presentation are all ones that are very valid, useful resources that are legitimate and based in good science. I think that if you're able to have that type of level of quality with your discussion with your provider, then they should be responsive to it. I do think that um, uh, if they're being resistant, I think the best technique to, in response to that is to challenge them with, well, then give me direction as to where you think I can gain more information from. And so when they're not able to give you that, or if they're unable to give you that, then I think you have to just kind of go back and say, okay, well then, if you don't have different, this is legitimate information, can you look at this with me? And then create a game plan from there. This isn't intimidating. Okay. Um, I'll try not to ramble in my question or get emotional. So um, kind of to piggyback on all of that question, um, you're a rare doctor that actually cares about, I don't know, quality of life, not common. Um, I am one that advocates a lot because I have another pretty severe autoimmune disease. Sorry. I have dumped a lot of doctors. I always tell them I'm interviewing them first. <laughs> But I seem to find that nobody asks those questions. Can I help my kid with homework? Or all of those things, sorry. And it's just that this is as good as it gets, sorry. How do we push them to not say, but you're better than you were? It's still not a quality of life. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for the question, and, and thank you for um, sharing. Um, 
I will tell you that I take this journey very personally um, because my mom has multiple sclerosis and is the reason I became a doctor. And I'm going to try not to get emotional. Um, she, she developed symptoms uh, right after she gave birth to my brother. I was five years old. I didn't know any better, right? And her interaction with her physician completely ch changed the trajectory of my entire family's life. Because at the time, which was 30 years ago, it was a di diagnosis of very little knowledge and no treatments. And so she was told, you get steroids. If you get better, great. If you don't, it is what it is. She was in a wheelchair with a six-month-old and three other kids. And for her, she was mind over matter. I'm going to get better. There's not anything else. But then she chose not to see a neurologist for over 20 years until I said, Mom, you have to see a neurologist. I'm going to be a neurologist, and you can't embarrass me by having multiple sclerosis and not having a neurologist. <laughs> and so I take that experience so personally because of the fact that she continued to have flares. And if I were to show you a picture of her brain MRI, it's, it's devastating. Because of lack of treatment options, that doesn't mean you have lack of caring for your patient. It doesn't mean you don't consider it a full picture. She was a new mom with four, a total of four kids and was given no hope. And so these are the reasons that I ask these questions. The thing about medicine is that most doctors went into medicine because they have similar stories to that. And so I very frequently, when I speak to other doctors, I play on those heartstrings because we need to be reminded not to be cynical and not to call you the narcoleptic patient or the idiopathic hypersomnia patient. You are Jen Smith, who has a family, who has a career, who has dreams and aspirations who just so happily has a diagnosis of narcolepsy, who just so happily has a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. And so we can't define you by your disease. We need to define you by your terms. And so I encourage patients to remind doctors or whoever their care professional is that you're not the narcoleptic patient, you're not the idiopathic hypersomnia patient. You have subjectivity to yourself. You have a name. You have dreams, you have aspirations, you have a quality of life that is expected. And you want to ask those questions of how do we determine progress? How can we use measurable outcomes that are important to me, not just validated scales, to say that we're going in the right direction? And so it is sometimes that you have to be that broken record, reminding them that this is how you want to be measured, this is how you want to determine your progress, and that you want to play ball and use, use their scales as well, but you also have to realize that I'm the person who has all these other things that are very important for me to experience.